Greetings to you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Once again, I am glad to meet you all on this Sunday. Even though the weather is so unfavorable in many ways, but God has provided us and blessed us to come together in worshiping and to listen to His words. So, the topic that we have for this Sunday's meditation is Word of God, a double-edged sword. Word of God, a double-edged sword. When we see the phrase Word of God, we immediately ta- are taken back into looking into the Bible. So, as it is, today we are celebrating the Bible Sunday. So, when we look upon our Bible, it is a history of people who have experienced God's presence and was led by God in faith. So, it is not exactly as it is as a history. We have experiences of people written down, shared through generations for people to understand who our God is. And many ways, God has revealed to these people who believed in Him as well to show the right path and the right way of living. And for those who have believed, they have recorded of how our God who has sent His only Son to redeem ourselves as well. So, it is through the scripture God is revealed as well as through the experience of our ancestors, God is continuing to reveal himself throughout our lives as well. So, here we see God has given us his word and revealed himself as well as his will for us. And so, we are enabled to accept these words and live by it day by day. So, the word of God not just reveals God, it enlightens us and challenges us to live in hope and in peace through Jesus Christ. So the word of God is a revelation of who God is, how God is acting within the human history and showing us a path where we are redeemed and saved by him and led to show the world who our real God is. So likewise, when we think upon this, we are called to meditate upon the three texts that we have given today. Jeremiah chapter 36 verses 1 to 10, then Hebrews chapter 4 verses 11 to 13, and the scripture passage that we heard read, uh, had read, Luke chapter 1 verses 5 to 17. So firstly, I would like to point out, God gives his word. God gives his word. It's not just giving something to someone, like for a child, giving a toy, it's not like that. When God gives his word, it is full of his revelation and guidance. So, when we read Jeremiah chapter 36 verses 1 to 10, the fourth year of Jehoiakim was, uh, was in 605 BC. The year was a fateful battle between the Egyptians and the king Joshua. So, as we read in the history, he was defeated and Judah beca- comes under the control of Egypt. This we can read in Jeremiah chapter 46 verse 2 and Second Chronicles chapter 35 verses 20 to 27. So he, Jehoiakim, got into the throne mainly because the Egyptians killed his brother or deposed his brother Jehoaz. So Jeremiah, here in this ministering situation, he was in the 23rd year of ministry, God is commanding him to write down his words. He was instructed specifically to write down, note down for all the nations to read his word, read his guidance. It was not just for the Israel and Judah, but it was all for the nations around the world. When we see Jeremiah's, the book of Jeremiah, we see that the first half, almost 44th chapter, up to 44th chapter, we see it was specifically pointed towards the Israel and Judah. But then, after that, the following chapters from 45 to 56, 52, we see it was addressing to the rest of the nations. So this is what theologians call it as inspiration, a miraculous working of the Holy Spirit through human writers. We have not got our scripture within just one day or so. 
It was generations of people's experience written down through what they have understood as what God has revealed. Mainly we see that God has revealed to people according to what they have understood. He has not bombarded them with the ideas and concepts that they couldn't understand. He didn't put them vocabularies. He didn't control them like a robot. He enabled them. He inspired them to reveal God as much as what they have understood through their faith experience. So it was not a heavenly dictation that we have as a scripture here. We have is the styles and distinctive vocabularies of each and every writer throughout the centuries. We have people's experience written down in ways that it was spoken to them as they have understood. So Jeremiah spoke these words to his secretary Baruch and he wrote down these, uh, these scrolls. So God uses, God uses human instruments to proclaim the word of God to his people. That's why we, have, we can read in Romans chapter 10 verse 11, How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they hear without the preacher? Since Jeremiah wasn't allowed to go to the temple, he sent his secretary Baruch. So here Baruch goes and he waits patiently there. For how long he waits? For almost a day he waits for the crowd to gather. And there he is preaching the word of God. There he is showing the warning that God is giving for these people. And he took advantage of it. So over the centuries, God's enemies have tried to suppress God's word. For a fact, even church was against translation of the Bible from Latin to English. John Wycliffe was the first person who, who risked his own life into translating this Bible. The church itself was against translations, but then now we know how much translations have helped us. How much translations have enabled us to read in our scripture in our own mother tongue. Here we see these kind of suppressions, no matter from where it comes, God's word is revealed without anyone can stop it. No one could stop it as whoever stood against it have always failed. There may be persecutions, there may be protests, there may be blockades, but then God's word is never stopped. That's why we read in Matthew chapter 24 verse 35, Heaven and earth shall, shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Isaiah 48 says, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. Translators and preachers of the word have been persecuted and martyred, but the truth of God stands tall. Here we see that the word of God is revealed with three grand purposes and the possibilities of how it affects human life can be seen in these three levels. It brings, it calls for uh, earnest attention. It calls for people to look towards God. It calls, it beckons us to look to God. People who are going away from God are called back. That's what God, word of God does. Then we have, it reveals or brings in a penitent prayer. One who is faithful is strengthened through the prayers. So there, this word of God is assuring them with the prayers. Then it brings moral reconciliation. This reconciliation brings about what was as a hindrance to peace and how it binds us with God. It mends the relationship that we have with God. And God has ordained that his word should be spread by preaching and teaching. It's not that uh, publishing of a biblical literature and uh, giving tracts is not good. That is another way of doing his ministry. But God's word needs to be preached and it needs to be taught. It needs to be meditated upon. It needs to be reflected upon. To make it relevant in our lives in every day. So, but it is the preaching of the word, word that God especially blesses us. 
God uses his words to convert his people from sin and leads them to an honest repentance and then brings them to an assurance of salvation. Baruch was seeking to warn Judah to flee from God's uh, flee into the hands of God's mercy. Because the judgment was approaching, there he stood as a person who was warning all these people. Today we are also seeking to win people for Christ because we are living in a position where that God has provided us a lot of us an opportunity to use our talents to reveal the word of God through our lives, through our words and through our action. The second thing that I would like to point out is we act on word of God. We act on word of God. When God reveals to us, we need to act on it. When you see a water boiling, what do you do? In the kitchen, when the water is boiling, what do you do? You keep staring at it. You go and put off. You go and put off the stove. Because after boiling, there is no point in boiling more and more. Because after that, it doesn't increase in temperature. It just goes into vapor. You are going to waste energy and the boiled water as well. Likewise, when you receive the word of God, you act on it. You work towards it. So, the heart of every problem is the problem in the heart. The heart of every problem is the problem in the heart. The people of Israel, they have hardened their hearts because they have erred in their hearts in a way that they have wandered away from God and they have wandered into the world of unbelief. They couldn't trust God who have rescued them from Egypt and is leading through a wilderness path. They couldn't trust. And they found that it is better to be a slave under the Egyptians than to be in the wilderness with God in freedom. That is where they got deluded by the unfaithfulness. They doubted that God was adequate for them. When a person has an erring heart, a disbelieving heart, the result of it is a hardened heart. This is the heart that is un insensitive to the word of God. No matter how much the word of God is revealed to them or given to them, they will not be able to hold on to it. They will not be able to sink those words into their heart because their heart has hardened. A cold heart is what the world calls it. A cold heart is insensitive to the uh, insensitive to all their feelings, including the feelings of God. And here we see the hardness of heart in the Israel made the people to return back to Egypt. And that desire made them to act against God, to rebel against God. It is the going back which made them to get one of the most troubled moments in their life. One whole generation was stopped from getting into Cana. One whole generation was not allowed to get into Cana because they hardened their heart. And here we see in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 11, they shall not enter into my rest. That's what God has said. They shall not enter into my rest. Are we believing in the word of God? Are we acting in the word of God or acting against the word of God? Moses' legal system of that day cannot be we cannot go back to that system because we don't have that sort of a priesthood we have now. What we have is the word of God leading into a life in justice and truth. What we need to do is to have a faithful life, to go back to Christ if we have wandered away from God and into a system of truth and justice from a system of compromise and bondages. We can't stay with compromises and bondages. We need to live in a life that is filled with freedom and justice. This is especially true in the times of persecution and suffering. Because it is only during the persecution and suffering people reveal their true self. A true believer is set apart. 
they don't go back they don't go back they don't go back to their sinful life they don't want to be in the sinful state that is why the persecution tests people we can see this again in hebrews chapter 3 verses 6 and 14 we are not saved by holding to our confession the fact is that we hold on to our confession as a proof that we are the true children of god it is important that we take our listening and absorbing the word of god and recognize the spiritual dangers that are existing all around us but it is also important that we encourage each other to be faithful in god hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 we get this impression that some of the believers address were careless about their fellowship in uh, the local assembly there christians belonging to christians belong to each other and we need each other moses caleb joshua did try to encourage israel they encouraged them to be together and when the nation refused to enter cana the people were not willing to listen the emphasis in the book of hebrews is that the true believer have an eternal salvation a true believer have an eternal salvation and trust in the living savior who constantly intercedes for them christ is the one who intercedes for us but the waiter but the, but the writer is careful to point out that the confidence is no excuse for sin we are eternally saved but that should not become as an excuse for excuse or an allowance to sin god disciplines his children is what we see in the scripture remember that cana is not a picture of heaven but these people were not allowed to enter into cana they were not allowed to enter into cana because they rebelled against him did not miss heaven they rebelled against god but they didn't miss heaven because they are redeemed but they do miss the blessings of inheritance today because of our sinfulness it is not that we are going to lose heaven but we are going to lose the blessings that we are going to receive today here and they must suffer the chastening of god that is how when people act against god god's word is a double edged sword you know what is the difference between a double edged sword and a one side a single edged sword a single edged sword is used for both offense and defense it is used by those who are those who are into the beginning of beginning to take as a career as a soldier in those days those who are not that good in fighting with swords they use the sword the one side as to defend and the other side for offense whereas in the case of a double edged sword it is used only for offense it's not for defense it pierces it is only for attacking that is used only by those who are advanced in their skills in sword fighting the word of god giving a word of god is giving us an illustration of that sort of sword so those people who are using the word of god are like those who are using the sword which is a double edged sword which needs to pierce which needs to pierce into our hearts with the truth and justice of god with the faith that god has given us too many believers fail to hear and act on god's word and thus rob themselves of the blessings it takes diligent nature spiritually to become mature and so a believer needs to apply god's word faithfully and honestly we need to act on what god has given us we can't just sit quietly and look at the boiling water we need to act and to use it the third thing that i would like to point out is based on luke chapter 1 verse 5 to 17 word of god is fulfilled when we act on the word of god that is where the word of god gets fulfilled here we see in luke chapter 1 was 5 to 17 it was the days of herod the king it is herod the great and where 
not it was not the best of the days in the history of israel it was not the happiest moment in jewish people's lives but this priest zakaria and his wife elizabeth are one of the most devoted people even in the darkest of the moments in history god has faithful people throughout the history even though the world has grown dark or turned away from god there are people who are faithful to him there are people who are constantly in in expressing their faith there in luke, uh, luke itself we can see zakaria his wife elizabeth simeon then anna and these are the people who are standing as an example here and here we see that they prayed and they had a blessed life a blessed married life where they show reverence to god together in faith god announces finally an answer to their prayer and we all know what was the answer and how zakaria acted zakaria asked for a sign a symbol from god to show the world that what god is doing for them but then what happens he had a pinch of doubt but then the sign turned into turned the asking for a sign made him into a unbeliever that is where our unbelief silences us us so god made him dumb until the child is born and is how many days old 8 days old until then he will be dumb that's what we read in second corinthians 4:13 unbelief silences us unbelief silences us the word of god is revealed and set in motion when we are faithful here this family is setting a model of faith what sort of faith god demands unquestioning faith is what is needed they both walked into the commandments of god it is a happy match between a husband and wife who are one not only in themselves but in faith as well a pattern for their imitation who wait at god's altar and are employed in and about holy things that they are called upon all people of the gospel must be what zacharias and Elis- zacharia and elizabeth are here said to be blameless we are called to be blameless no one should blame us we should not put ourselves in a position that others have started to blame us because of our incompetence because of our unfaithfulness because of our inadequate actions we should position ourselves in god and submit ourselves to god to perform the right and the truth and to act on the word of god until we begin to perform these duties we cannot be righteous before god nor walk in any of his commandments or ordinances for inspiration declared without faith is an impossible to be pleasing we cannot please god without faith a sailor who sails into the sea who wants to come back home must use a compass and a map if he doesn't want to use compass and a map and he continues to sail he may never reach home he may never reach home when first people discovered america they thought it was india when uh, first sailors reached america they thought it was india and named those people indians and that's why we have red indians today it is because of the people who gave them the names likewise they have missed their way they didn't know it was there they thought they went around the world but they discovered an entire new continent likewise if we don't have the compass and map of god's word we will be roaming somewhere else let us stray with unbelief walking in all god's ordinances and commandments blamelessly implies a maintaining of the worship of god in the family our expression of faith has to start from the family within our family experienced in the family it has to revealed through the families 
that's why we call ourselves one family in the body of Christ it is one family in the body of Christ so a proper use of good things which God has given us to be encrusted in the word of God God approves and requires us to possess such a character he commands us to be righteous before him no compromises of course our God is merciful and accepts us in our inadequacies but through his grace we are made perfect consider how much it would to promote our happiness the present happiness that we have and possess such a character that it reveals God through our lives through the words that he has given us God gives his words to gain our attention upon something more important and valuable he paves way for a moral reconciliation and restoration upon acting on the word of God we are blessed and becomes allies to God through our faithfulness to the word of God we are acting on the God's powerful acting as God's powerful instruments in this world to bring changes to it as well as changes in ourselves to make ourselves blameless in front of him blameless in front of God and to walk in the path of truth and justice to walk in the word of God to act in the word of God and to live a life in the word of God may God bless these words and let us spend some moments in silence and reflect upon the words that we have just heard may god bless us